Hey, weeks to the end of the semester, right? Are we going to make it? We're going to do it. We're going to do it. All right. Um, Brady is going to start. He'll offer an opening prayer for us, and then we'll see if there's any announcements or other things we have to talk about. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come here this day and listen to the presenter, and we pray that we might have the Spirit. We pray that we might have our minds and our hearts centered on Christ and learn about how we can hear our careers and our lives towards him. We pray, Father, for these blessings and do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brady. All right, what announcements do we have? Where is... If so, real fast, if you can hear me. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Haley. Awesome. Next, in two weeks, we have our White Elephant Gift Exchange after seminar, but we need everybody to sign up on the soup and food list so we can bring all sorts of Christmas food and have a big meal, not just soup and rolls. So if everyone can go on that page, I'll put up the PDF uh, flyer on the walls and stuff, so that will be awesome. And then we'll have waffles the last day of school on the 14th. That's it. Hey, they're both written on the board right here, guys. So sign up on Sue. We want Christmas party. We want waffles to be well attended. So I think, is there any other announcements or anything we have? Now, is there a bar in front of your presentation there? I think we're ready to go, guys. Is that right? It's great how this always works exactly <laughs> the way we want it to, and the same every week, right? All right, we'll just like we'll be happy with the way it How's that? Okay. Um, our presenter today is Sean Dixon from the UVU Institute, the director of the UVU Institute. Is that right? So he is here to talk about uh, what he's calling Innovating Institute, some changes that they've been making you know, over the last few years as they've tried to understand their population a little bit more. We're grateful to have him with us today. So if you'll please join me in welcoming Sean Dixon to our seminar. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, it's an honor for me to be here. Um, I'm a BYU graduate. I graduated back in 1994, so it's been a long time ago. Um, I have five children, and three of them have graduated from BYU, and my fourth is here right now. Um, my my parents attended BYU, so this is a this is a place that I love and am familiar with. And even though I teach across the way over at uh, the Utah Valley Institute, I. I feel like I'm definitely definitely a cougar at heart. So um, I have been teaching uh, for the church educational system in seminary and institute for the last, I think this is my 30th year. So I've been doing this for a while. My first 18 years, I was working uh, in the seminary program here in Utah County. So I've taught at many different seminaries here. Uh, and then I left to be a mission president down in Southern California. And when I came back from being a mission president, um, I went to the Utah Valley Institute. I think of note, Utah Valley Institute is not the UVU Institute. Uh, it's for all of Utah Valley. We have a lot of BYU students that come out and take institute classes there. I'm also what's called the region director for uh, the Utah Valley Institute region. So uh, are any of you here, have you ever gone to a stake institute class like in your pro YSA stakes? So we have coordinators that, that work under me that, that then work with those institute classes as well. So anything that has to do with institute in Utah Valley is something that, that I'm in charge of and concerned about. So I want to talk to you about uh, this, this concept that we're calling Innovating Institute. Institute's an interesting thing. Um, how many of you grew up and went to seminary? Raise your hand if you grew up and went to seminary. So there is a lot of of institutional effort to get kids to seminary. Um, it's just kind of a given. There's a lot of, you know, the wards are, and stakes are very geared around getting students, uh, young or youth to, to, to attend seminary. Uh, parents usually are very dialed into seminary and really working on that. There's a lot of scaffolding 
in the lives of youth that kind of shepherd them to seminary. But when they get to be institute age, uh, that's a little different. If you come to BYU, you have religion classes, but anywhere else in the world, if you're working or if you're going to to school at any other campus, there are there is institute set up so that anybody could have kind of an equivalent experience to what people get here at BYU. You have these religion classes that you can take if you're going to Ohio State or if you're going to SUU. Um, if you're just working, you're a young adult and you're working and, and you want to have these religion classes, that's what Institute is set up for. But there's not as much, pre I don't know if pressure is the right word, but there's not as much effort from parents to get their young adults to take Institute because they figure you're 18 now, you're doing your own thing. There's not uh, a lot of priesthood leaders do what they can, but but it doesn't seem like there's the same kind of effort that's put into it. And so with Institute, basically what we have, there's not a grade attached like at BYU, you have to take your, where you have to take your religion classes and get a grade at Institute. It's like young adults take Institute if they want to take Institute. Does that make sense? Like if it's something they really want, they take it. And if they're getting fed while they're there, they stay. And so it's no when I, when I say fed, yeah, there is a food there is a physical food aspect, but if they're getting fed spiritually, so a teacher in institute, there is no guarantee that the, the students you have on the first day of class are going to continue with you throughout the semester, um, because it's not there's not really a grade involved. A lot of them will come when they can, right? And and if they can't come on a given night, they won't come. So there's kind of a fluctuating population there. And so we really had to figure out, we have to figure out what can we do to make Institute a place where young adults really want to be? Not so that we can build up the Institute, but because our mission really is to gather young adults to the Savior Jesus Christ and to help deepen their conversion to Jesus Christ and his restored gospel. And so we have to build an institute program that will do that, right? And then what we do is we shepherd people to institute, knowing that if they come to institute, they're going to come unto Christ. And I found the, the cause of like increasing enrollment at institute, that's not a, a really noble cause that the young adults are excited about. Oh, yeah, I want to increase this organization. But they do get excited about the idea of gathering to Christ and going to a place where that can happen at that critical stage of their life. And so we were learning a lot about the value of Institute, what it can do, and also maybe what was causing a decline in enrollment. And then the question, what could we do about that, right? So I want to start off with just maybe some statistics at first here. Uh, the church research department um, shows uh, that consistently attending institute is as predictive of lifelong discipleship as being born in the covenant, serving a mission, or being sealed in the temple. There is a really, really strong correlation between people who attend institute and then uh, lifelong discipleship. Institute has an impact on, on students as strong as attending a church college in religious outcomes, such as ch attending church, reading your scriptures, prayer, temple, spirit in your life, and testimony. So if we can really present Institute in the right way and students at all these other places attend, that is predict as predictive of those things as it would be to come here to BYU. Uh, recently, President Nelson uh, has, has given, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but President Nelson produced a video and he's talking about prophetic prompt. He's giving prophetic promises about what would happen in the life of a young adult if they attended Institute. So we on the ground at the Institute, we feel like we're like the, the ground troops trying to figure out how to do this and doing everything we can to increase marketing and, and just to help people understand what the brand of Institute is becoming. But on the ground, it gets pretty tough. And we, we said, you know what we need? We need F-16s to fly over and provide some air support, right? Because you know how you're just down there on the ground and it's tough. And this, this was a major F-16 flyover. So I want to show you this. 
And I just invite you to look for what does President Nelson say will happen in the life of a young adult who attends Institute? Okay, here we go. My dear brothers and sisters, I love you. I think about you and pray for you often. You are living in an age unlike any other. You are at the age where you are making crucial decisions, decisions that will affect the rest of your mortal and eternal life. They're not hearing that video, but you're asking if they are. Making these decisions may seem overwhelming or even frightening at times. But it is also exciting because we are living in a momentous time. May I invite you to do something that will help you in a way few other things can. Attend Institute. I have now watched my children, grandchildren, and many great-grandchildren attend Institute. Attending Institute has been life-changing for them. Institute has helped them and will help you to deepen your conversion to Jesus Christ. Attending Institute will help you to feel more of Heavenly Father's great love for you. Institute will offer you inspiring instructors, faithful friends, and a feeling of belonging. It will help you to see why living the gospel leads to never-ending happiness. Attending Institute will help you to live the gospel and to feel more joy right now. If you want to know the truth about who you really are, attend Institute. If you want to know the purpose of life, attend Institute. If you want to stay on the covenant path, attend Institute. If you want to learn how to let God prevail in your life, attend Institute. If you want to be a peacemaker, attend Institute. I promise you these blessings and express my love for you. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. Pretty good F-16 flyover, right? What did you see as some of the prophetic promises given by President Nelson that we could expect to happen if you attend Institute? Did any of them stand out to you? Yeah. Um, find faithful friends and the feeling of belonging. That's a big one. That's what we found the young adults really, really want. Faithful friends and a feeling of belonging. That's that's a, we'll talk about that one in just a minute, but that's a that's a major objective of what we're trying to create at the institute. Anything else stand out to you? Yeah. I like how we mentioned that you'll have increased joy. Increased joy. Yeah, that is it's that it's beyond just happiness. It's this long lasting brand of of happiness. Increased joy. Love it. What else? Anything else stand out? Yeah. You noticed it was like a summary of his messages. <laughs> like, peacemaker. So come to path. I like that. Exactly. I, that's one thing I really noticed is all of these objectives that President Nelson has had as a prophet, like learning who you really are and being a peacemaker and letting God prevail in your life. And all of he just kind of went through his last several talks and said, if you go to Institute, that is a place where you're going to learn to to be able to do those things that are the most important. Yeah, Annie? I also liked uh, how in General Conference, when he was talking about things celestial, he repeated it several times. Yes. And he did this with attendance, attend Institute, which I think just goes to show like he's really putting an emphasis on the importance of doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think it's, it's what we've established here, uh, according to that CRD research, according to what the prophet is saying. The Institute is a really, really valuable program of the church. The things that happen there 
are super impactful on young adults' lives, right? That's that's a given. The challenge is how to help the young adults to know that and how to, to reach them so that they can come and experience that for themselves. I want to show you um, uh, kind of an inflection point that we noticed in the trend. This is Worldwide Institute, so it's not necessarily right here in this valley, but you can notice that the top number is the number of Institute students. And about 2015 to 2016, we started to see a, a decline. You can see that every year it was just like, wow, we're going down from a high point of 356, 673. All of a sudden in 2021, you find ourselves around 291,000. So obviously when you see a slope going downward like that, it's super important to stop and ask yourself, okay, what's going on? There's a 19% a cumulative decline, 44% cumulative decline in the U.S. And uh, some of the largest declines were in the Utah large campus programs. And so what, what, what do we learn from that? What's going on? How do we reverse that? So we looked at some of the potential reasons for enrollment declines. Uh, one of them is this kind of coincided with the time when we we're trying to have some increased academic requirements at Institute, um, some things to, to really emphasize how they could get credit for the classes they were taking. And there was a pretty big emphasis on trying to graduate from Institute. If you graduate from Institute, it's the same, requir same requirements that they have here at BYU in the religious education department. So four core requirements and three electives. So there's a, there was kind of a push on that that came out about that time. Original reasoning was this would help deepen the learning experience, encourage continued participation. They're there to get credit. They may stay more and feel like they need to come to class every time rather than just kind of coming in and out, right? The long-term result, it seemed that there was a decrease in graduation rate, students attending without enrolling. And some of the young adults just said, hey, we just want to go to institute to learn, to fill the spirit, to have a sense of belonging. We don't want to worry about another class we're being graded on. Some of you may have felt that way about your religion classes. Like, hey, just want to really, right? And so, so that was maybe a potential thing that, that we learned. Number two is uh, the creation of the YSA. Transfer of, oops, sorry guys, oops. I think I've clicked too many times. There you go. So the transfer of activities to YSA wards. That used to be that institute, especially like Utah Valley Institute, was the hub for any multi-stake type activities where there wasn't YSA wards, there wasn't YSA stakes. So if you wanted to do something outside of your home ward and get with other young adults, Institute was the only place you could go. Now, all of a sudden, there's this creation of YSA stakes and wards and they have their own activities. And so the activity side of Institute was decreased because we didn't want to compete with the YSA wards and stakes. There was some concerns with fraternity and sororities, and so they discontinued those, which took some people out of the Institute as well. So that's their kind of thinking that could be a potential piece. Okay. A couple other things. You got the expansion of BYU-Idaho and online opportunities for religion classes. Obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, at the, I was teaching, I was there at the Institute when the, when COVID happened, I was made the director and then the next month COVID happened. And so we, we had to go all online with our classes and all those kinds of things. And so there was an impact. Uh, we found out there was lower undergraduate enrollment overall, fewer students on physical campuses. So you have a decrease at UVU and actually the people that are actually there on campus. And that was true just in general, a lot of classes are being offered online, that sort of thing. And then you also have a new generation, Generation Z, just built a little bit differently than previous generations. And we realized we have to deliver in their style, right? We can't be so stuck on former institutional ways of doing things like, this is Institute, and we're going to stick by it, right? Had to kind of ask ourselves, okay, what does this new generation need from their institute experience. So those are all not excuses, but they're external factors that we had to study. And 
anytime you're, you're in an educational program, research is so important to be able to understand your audience and to not be afraid of looking at what might be going wrong, right? Or not going wrong, but maybe what needs to change to adapt to the changing world that we live in, right? Instead of just being fixed in, hey, this is how I had it. This is how I like to learn. And I'm just going to stick with that. You start to really understand your audience. So uh, a research group called Boncom um, did some research where they did extensive interviewing of young adults to find out what young adults really need. And this was back in 2018. And as they did this research, they found out there was very strong evidence that young adults want four things in the world today. So Generation Z and this, this generation of young adults, four things that, that they really wanted. And here's, here's what they found. Number one, uh, it was sometimes worded as connection, but connection with God. But as we looked at that, we could tell really what, what they're saying is they wanted to empower personal connection to God and Jesus Christ by providing moments to fill their love. In other words, they wanted to go to a place where they could deepen their conversion to Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and really feel like they were filling their love. Right. Not just that they're there to connect with other people, although that's going to be one of the other things, but they really wanted a place where they can connect with God. So I don't want to just go to a place where I'm going to be entertained. If I go to a place, I want to have that conversion to Jesus Christ deepened. The second one is a sense of belonging, which is what you shared, right? Create a community of inclusivity as young adults and their friends are connected to a greater cause. It's very clear the rising generation, they're really motivated by causes. You probably notice that. And you probably feel that. Like, I want to be part of a great cause. You realize that the gathering of Israel, that's the greatest cause happening on planet Earth. But sometimes that cause had become a little bit white noise for young adults. They're like, oh, yeah, I did that on my mission. And now I'm going to get excited about all these other different causes. But to be able to come to a place where I feel belonging, that I'm part of something with other people, that's important and a place to belong and, and be inclusive and make sure that, that it's a place where everybody feels like they can belong and not just in some ways, I think the old branding of Institute that was maybe it was like a country club for the righteous and I'm different. And so I don't really belong there when we're like, that's, that's not the brand at all. Like Institute is for everybody. In fact, there's a lot of people that go to Institute now that aren't yet ready to go back to church, but they feel such a sense of belonging at Institute that this is a place where they can begin to feel like they belong and then move towards going to church. Another one was they want relevance, right? Provide experiences and support for young adults to safely navigate their spiritual and temporal challenges. Like we want classes that really pertain to our lives. Right? We, don't, we don't want things that that people that are older are deciding that we want, like we, we want to tell you what we want in our life, what we need, and then uh, have classes that are really re relevant. Maybe not just classes, but experiences that are really relevant to us. And then the last one uh, is accessibility. And that is to reach young adults where they are by providing more times and ways to, to uh, participate in institute experiences. Realizing that there's so many things competing for your time, we had to find a way to make institute accessible, not just say, hey, here's where we're offering it and when we're offering it, and you make your life conform to that. It was like, okay, where do you want it? How do we get it out to where you are and deliver it to you in the way that you think would be most helpful to you? So these four things have become like really big talking points um, in seminar or in, in the Institute world where we're just always evaluating what we're doing by, is this going to be a creative place of belonging? Is it going to be relevant? Is it going to deepen their conversion to Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ? And how can we make our programs more accessible to, to, the, to the students? So the Board of Education... Uh, which is consists of uh, the you know the uh, apostles and first presidency and other church leaders. 
uh, they're the ones that, that govern final decisions on things. And so they gave the following approvals about ways that we could, what we started to call Innovate Institute. In order to reverse those declines, how can we Innovate Institute? And so here's some of the approvals that were given. Innovate the teacher and the, the way that the teacher would be teaching. Offered new courses. So let's think outside the box for relevant needs of students and what courses might meet those needs. To allow local adaptation of those courses. We could even change the title if we thought that the title of a class uh, it seemed not very relatable. We could change the title so that it could reflect more what was there. Less formal physical environments. Uh, I don't know if you've been over it to the UVU Institute or Utah Valley Institute lately, but the, the types of chairs, there's just real modern type of, of learning environment that's much less formal, flexible furniture. The rooms have like, uh, most of the rooms have little couches. If someone wants to decide to sit on a couch or these little uh, spinny desks that you can, you can so, so there's a lot of collaboration in class so that you could move around freely and have a, lot, a really learner center environment. So the, the classrooms changed a lot. Significant investments were, were made. We, we didn't want the institute buildings to look like a stake center, but to look more like a new educational environment um, with, with that, the kind of furnishings and things on the wall that would kind of like speak to young adults. Um, collaborate in hosting activities, offering workshops. Never had that before in institute. A workshop would be like a three to five week small course for busy students who don't have time for a semester, they could take a specific workshop on a subject like appreciating and understanding my patriarchal blessing. Four weeks taught by a patriarch with patri with local patriarch speakers coming in to help students understand that. Oh, I want that topic. Maybe I don't have time for a full course, but I would love a workshop. And so developing workshops, hybrid, virtual, digital experiences, uh, I'm the co-host of a podcast that we started at the Institute. It's called the Preach My Gospel Mission Prep Podcast for uh, mission prep students. It's me and two other former mission presidents hosted a weekly podcast coming out of the Institute as an offering of the Institute. We felt like so many of the mission prep students, especially the young men, never made it to Institute before they went on the missions. And so we we're able to have this offering that reached out to them to do it. And now we've, our second season is for the return missionary as they come home. They can listen to this podcast with all these guests helping them successfully transition home. We have an online institute group now that, that you can have institute classes. No matter where you live in the state of Utah, you can just get online and you have all kinds of offerings of online. So that's what that's all about. Non-traditional schedules, um, Saturday morning classes, uh, we have uh, class of group at the Utah Valley Institute. It's the biggest institute in the world. So that in Utah State. And so we can offer a wide variety classes on Monday through Friday, all day from eight to four. And then Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, all night we have classes. We even have a Saturday morning class called Mountain Messages, where we go on hikes up into the mountains and talk, uh, discuss general conference talks and scripture blocks up in the mountains. So just kind of these unique times of doing things. Uh, a lot more measurement of what we're doing, saying, okay, if we do something innovative, what we do is we have to write it up and then we measure it. We do surveys to see if this is working, to see if we can continue to do that. And then we share our findings uh, through an through a internet system where we're able to go on and see what other institutes are doing, what's working, and see if we want to implement that into ours. Right. And then just this charge to keep innovating. So I'll just tell you a few things at the Utah Valley uh, Institute of Religion that we've some innovations that we've done. Here's some new classes. We have a class called Atomic Habits, Changing Your Life with Christ. So it's using the principles from the book, Atomic Habits, and then seeing how you could change your religious habits through the Savior, but using those proven principles in that book. It's really an amazing class. Answering my gospel questions. At the beginning of that course, students come together and just share what are their concerns, what are their questions, what are they wrestling with. 
put them up on the board and they design the course around the students' questions that they have, teaching them how to seek answers to questions, how to seek revelation, where the resources are that they can find to get answers to their questions. <clears throat> An incredible class that's probably one of the most popular classes that we've had is The Divine Gift of Forgiveness. It's based on Elder Anderson's book. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that book? It's, it's this incredible book about coming into Christ. I've had the chance to teach that course. It's pretty cool. Elder Anderson's book has 28 chapters and there's 28 weeks in an institute semester um, or 28 classes, 14 weeks, but if we're going two times a week. And so it's just an awesome class to, to learn how to come to Christ. We have women in the scriptures, a class called Amazed by Grace, just this coming unto Christ class, Last Days and the Second Coming, class based on the book Faith is Not Blind by the Hafens, about uh, the model of, of like complexity. How, how, what do you do if you're in complexity and how do you get to the simplicity beyond complexity? Christ-like attributes. This one is huge. Seminary and Institute were never in the arena prior of uh, being in the temple prep business. That was always a priesthood function. And we've innovated this new curriculum, which is amazing, understanding Christ through temple worship. And uh, it's an approved course for us to teach. It's great for, for temple prep, but also just temple enhancement. Students are just really much more deeply understanding the endowment and that whole process through this class. It's, it's an awesome one. My plan for return missionaries, got a class they can enroll in right when they get home, hear him, know him. Students have, as we've surveyed, said, we want classes on how we can get revelation, how we can know how to move forward. And this class is how do we hear God and how do we come to know him? We've had a, a really great outreach to the Latino community. We started with 14 classes, 14 students in a Spanish class, and now we have 250 Latino students that are coming to classes in their own language. We have Polyne a class for Polynesian um, outreach, and we just finally got secured for this next semester a class for Koreans. There's a cluster of about 30 Koreans that are going to come, and, and we're going to have a class for them. So those are some classes. Here's some ideas of workshops I told you about, Mountain Messages, Appreciating and Understanding My Patriarchal Blessing. I had students come into my class. And they said, we're in the LGBTQ community, but there is nowhere we can go that can support us in wanting to be faithful to our covenants and to the Savior and to have a community where we can get together and talk about that. And uh, they're like, can we have a course? And so it was approved. We have a fantastic teacher there. And it was approved that we could have a gathering of these students. And so we every semester... This is this is a, a really, really popular course that we have. It's for LGBTQ plus students and allies, which obviously is very non-traditional. I had a counselor over at UVU stop me. Uh, I was outside in front of the Institute and he rolled down the window. He said, are you are you Sean Dixon? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I just want you to know the workshop that you're having for the LGBTQ members of your church. I can tell you right now, it is saving lives. I won't go into details, but there are some lives that have been saved because they had a place where they could go. It was really always constantly evaluating, is this, is this effective? Is this what we should be doing? And that was really neat to hear how that happened. We do have a class from a BYU graduate who's on our faculty. Um, he graduated in the family sciences, and we have a lot of students that want to better understand uh, the body, sexual intimacy, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we've had so many students take that workshop and just understand this is why I live the law of chastity now. I fully understand it because I appreciate sexual intimacy as something that's not evil, but it's something that's this part of part of a marriage and all these things. So this this has been a, a, a hugely popular workshop that continues to happen. Another, just a shorter workshop on principles of personal revelation, the science of joy and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We had a teacher that's like, okay, I want to innovate. We have a, a, some, some students that were up at their apartment complex, and he got with the owner of the complex. They had like a fire pit 
up there in the middle of that apartment complex. And they're like, would you care if we had like a campfire and, or, and uh, had anyone that wanted to come, we sit around and we talk about, come follow me around this. And so there's a lot of students that didn't, couldn't, didn't want to make it all the way to the Institute building. So we brought a campfire Institute to them. And that was, that was really cool. And that's now turned into a class that's taught in the, um, what do you call it? It's like, uh, I don't know, the, inside the, 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 the complex, there's like a room in there. It's actually taught right there. So they don't even have to go to an Institute building to have a gathering. That's kind of an example of accessibility. We realized publicity and marketing is a big, big problem. Like so all the students that were coming we're having like huge impact in their lives and they loved it. But we also realized like, there's so many people out there that weren't coming just because they didn't know about it. And so like, how do we market? And we realized the most important thing we could do is to gather the gatherers. It's to help the students that come to go out and to bring their friends. And so there's big emphasis on that. We also, they're like the UVU Institute or Utah Valley Institute looks like another, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's the same brick. It's everything. It looks exactly like another building on campus. People don't even realize what it is. I meant to get a picture for this, and I didn't get it done. But we now put blew up a picture of all of these students just having a great time. And then it's called The Gathering Place. And so we're rebranding the building as The Gathering Place. And inside The Gathering Place, we have institute classes and we have sports we have all these other things, and I'll get into that in just a minute. But there's, uh, there's like in several places around the building, these big colorful blowups of students. Uh, the students said, we want to be able to have the outside of the building reflect what's going on on the inside of the building. And, and so we just barely got those up. We're excited to see the impact. We have uh, a campaign right now. It's called, it's got like the you are here symbol, and it's you are stronger here you are needed here you are loved here you are fill in the blank and then we have these we're getting these little breadcrumbs on the sidewalk up going up to the institute where it might say you are needed here with a little qr code a student can just you know click that and watch a video about a student telling their story about how i just came home from my mission and i wasn't feeling needed anymore I didn't have a calling and I came to the Institute, I got involved on a committee and I, and just, you are needed here. And so there's just that, that campaign of, of reaching out. Like I mentioned, we have podcasts, we have one called the art of dating. You guys should check it out. If you're not married, super good. A guy named Ryan Eggett. I don't know if you've heard of him. He led the MTC choir for years and he's just so good and because he did so much with music he only was able to teach one other class and he taught this dating and courtship class. And one of his students came up to him and said, brother Eggett, this is so limiting. You teach one time and everybody needs this class. She said, you should do a podcast. And this was just before innovating Institute was coming out. I'm like, you can't do that. She's like, why not? He's like, I don't know how to do that. And she's like, I'll do it. I'll learn how he goes. Do you know how to do a podcast? She goes, no, but I'll learn. So this girl, Kayla Greer, learned how to do a podcast, set it all up, got Brother Eggett in, and this is a very hugely popular podcast that um, is there because of this innovation, right? Um, we have now students, we built a podcast room in the basement in an old office, got the equipment and everything. We have students that run a podcast called Beyond the Complexity, where they interview other students who have gotten beyond the complexity of their issues with the gospel and have come unto Christ. And they also in that podcast interview teachers. So teachers can talk about how they've gotten beyond the complexity and just kind of realizing, Hey, it's okay to be a seeker. It's okay to have questions, to be confused, to be in complexity. That's normal. And this podcast just explores it. We just kind of provided them the equipment, everything they need. And we don't even, like the students just run and they're like, this is so great. Because before we just didn't have the equipment. We had the know-how. Now we have all that we need there at the Institute. And podcasts, obviously, they reach a lot of students. Um, and so we, we have this wrestle. Is that our lane? Um, is this pulling students who would be coming here? Because the main focus of Institute, it's a gathering place. 
and podcasts don't allow that, but we're hoping that the podcast will reach people and then also invite them to come in and gather. So it's an innovation that we're currently studying to see, see how it would work. Again, just a lot of innovating with, with what's going on inside, as well as innovating our teaching. And I'll talk about that um, just in a second here. So when we interview, innovate things, the first thing we have to do before we can start something new is we have to understand our audience. We always ask the question, is this something the students are wanting or is this something a 50 year old man thought would be cool? Right. So we interview students, we have focus groups. What do you want? What do you need? And then based on what they say, uh, we also look at what others are doing. We have a, a site, a SharePoint site where we can see what other institutes are doing. Then we test our ideas out. And if they work, they can become a permanent part of what we do at the Institute. So this was a real innovation. It used to be very much institutional. Here's what you do. Here's what you're allowed to do. Here's the classes you can teach. Now our teachers come into my office all the time. Hey, I've got this idea for a new class. What do you think? I'm like, what makes you think that will work? Well, all these students have been telling me they want that. Let's go see if it's already been done. If it's already been done, we look at it. If not, we're like, yeah, why don't you write up a proposal? They write it up. We send it uh, to Salt Lake and say, hey, we, we're going to test out this new idea. And they're like, great. And we test out a new class. So we've had a lot of classes that have originated just in a teacher's mind, actually in students' minds as they've talked to, to teachers. So I'm glad that we have that ability to do that um, and, and institutes now set up around that ability to do it. I'm gonna move kind of quickly here. So our big things now are we focus more on intrinsic motivators, less on ac academic students have spoken. If you wanna graduate from institute, we've got it. If you wanna get credit in the class so you can do that, we've got it. If you wanna go because you, you have just, Every once in a while you can make it, that's awesome. Um, if, you, if your friend brings you one night, come to Institute. So it's, it's something for everybody instead of us trying to get everybody to fit into to one box with it. Okay, number two. We offer a wider set of campus institute activity services and resources. And then we're going outside the campus to offer greater flexibility for stake institutes that go out. And I'll show you these really quick here. Go through that. The biggest, the biggest thing I think I would tell you is YSA empowerment, using YSA councils and committees to find out what they want and what they need. It's all being driven by YSAs collaboration, and then local adaptation based on local needs. Those are the principles. Um, really quick here. I want to tell you about this idea. It's, we call it the hub and spoke idea. At a campus institute, you can look in the general handbook of constructions. They now said we're authorized to establish what are called gathering places. In the gathering place on a campus institute, institute is the hub. It's kind of the center of what happens there. So we have spokes. We have sports tournaments because we have these great facilities that are, that are there. We have service projects. We have food. We have devotionals. We have workshops. We have addiction recovery. Uh, we now are authorized to get a counselor, uh, a full-time therapist to be housed at the institute. So it's, it's becoming a, a one, we're still waiting to get that to happen, but we're working on that. It's a one-stop shop for young adults to have everything they want, dances, everything there, and institutes at the hub of that, okay? So it's this kind of hub and spoke, institute, family services, all these other things that are available, okay? Now they've said, well, you can also create hub and spoke things at YSA stakes. I don't know if any of you are involved in that, but... In that case, in the YSA, the hub is the stake and the ward. That's the hub. And then they can choose what spokes they want to have in their gathering place. They can have institute classes. They can have life skill classes. They can have activities, all those sorts of things. And this is another way that institute is growing and, and becoming bigger. So we have these 
these gathering places. So that's kind of the new branding. Come to the gathering place, take a class, enjoy a sports tournament, be where you can belong with other young adults. So this is, this is not complete yet, so ignore this part right here. But you can see what's happened as we've started to innovate Institute. The numbers in uh, the last two years, Institute number of Institute students, rather than declining, have increased by 57,000 students. At the Utah Valley Institute this year, we have 600 more students enrolled than we had last year at this time. And we have 2,000 more headcount. So the difference of enrollment and headcount, enrollment is if they register and they sign the roll. Um, headcount is, I don't want to sign a roll. I'm just here with my friend or I, I don't want anyone to follow up with me. You know, I'm just here to enjoy it. And so we just count the number of heads that are there, which is always more than the number that enrolled. Headcount's up 2,000 and enrollment's up 600 just over the course of the last year. So we know that <clears throat> listening to students, letting them lead out, uh, providing things to meet their needs are really, really starting to work. And, and you see these increases starting to happen, which is which is super exciting for us. Last thing I'll tell you is, is the, the brand of teaching that happens at Institute. I know I've just got two minutes. Sometimes we've had a lot of real technical educational models, like, you know, we, we, we really complex and all those kind of things. What we're really focused on right now is teaching in the Savior's way, and specifically in Institute, we're, we're really focused on these three, this Venn diagram, these three circles. We want all of our lessons to be very Christ-centered, to be based in the scriptures or the words of living prophets, and very learner-focused. Now, there are some classes, I don't know if any of you know about Dave Butler's class at the Institute, if any of you attended. That's a Thursday night class that's like a devotional. It's so big, there's like 800 people that come every week. Um, and so that's not, I guess, learner focused in the sense that he understands what that audience wants. And it's, it's, it's a big, large group presentation. But that same night, all around the building are smaller classes where it's very learner focused, very much based on discussion. And as I've taught those classes, it's so amazing how much the students have taught me and taught each other. We're there to facilitate a Christ-centered, scripture-based experience in the scriptures. This is our teach statement. We center each learning experience on Jesus Christ, his example, attributes, and returning power. If we're teaching about tithing, we're also teaching about how that connects us to Jesus Christ, not just teaching that independent of the Savior. Um, we help students learn the restored gospel of Jesus Christ is found in the scriptures and words of the prophets so that we can be anchored we help students fulfill their role in learning for themselves. <clears throat> Power the learner. We always talk about the learning experience rather than talking about teaching. We're talking about you're, you're, you're creating a learning environment for students. And then we strive to innovate, to invite the Holy Ghost to fulfill his role. So we believe when Christ-centered, learner-focused, and scripture-based all come together, that center focus is is deepening conversion. That's when conversion takes place, when, when those things all overlap. So we also, you'll notice maybe some of these um, things from, from uh, teaching in the Savior's way. And we have these, these matrix, matrixes. You might have been trained in this in Sunday school and things like that. This was intended to be for all teaching in the church. And so it's really cool how all of these things really connect back to that Venn diagram and help us to, to teach it that way. Like this, this one right here, this is all scripture-based, right? Love those that you teach. Uh, the top one is about teaching the same, teaching focused on Christ. So <clears throat> diligent learning, it all kind of comes back together that way. So, so I do a lot of teacher evaluation, sitting back of a lot of classes, and I'm, I'm looking for, is this, is this scripture-based? Is it learner-focused? Is it centered on Jesus Christ? And as I see those things happen, that's when you see magical things starting to take place in class. So anyway, thank you for your time. I hope that's been helpful. I guess part of it is just the process that we went through and maybe seeing that process could be helpful to you as you pursue 
you know, whatever it is you're pursuing in the educational environment or, or arena. So thank you so much. Grateful that Sean was able to be with us today. Um, thank you all for being here with us, those online as well. Uh, let's go get something to eat and let's push through the last couple of weeks. So we can do it, right? So, we'll see you next week. Thank you.